no matter what, I am going to honor and keep these vows. When you find yourself in a moment like a wedding day and you think to yourself, I really need to remember this moment. That's the kind of moment that Jesus is having with his followers. He's probably had lots of times where he's taught them things. He's probably had lots of times where they saw lots of different things, but this is different. This is one of those times where Jesus knows, I am about to give you some stuff that is never going to come your way again, and you need to take notes, because this this is serious. Jesus begins to teach them some of the most deep and profound truths about the kingdom of God in this teaching setting that we've been looking at. In John chapter 14, he starts off his section of teaching to them by saying these words. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust God and trust also in me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus begins to deal with the common issue that every single one of us can relate to of being afraid. Every single person in this room knows what it feels like to have anxiety over things that we can't control. Everybody in this room knows what it feels like to find ourselves in a situation that we wish we could change, but we know we just can't. Many of us in this room right now are in situations that we're living in a constant temptation to be afraid or to be scared. And last week we looked at this powerful truth that Jesus gave to us and to his followers when he said, you don't have to be afraid. He said, you are different when you learn how to live by my power with my spirit. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Another translation says it this way. Don't surrender to your fear. Don't lay down and let fear do what it wants to do to your life. You have a choice in every situation, whether you will surrender to fear or whether you will do something different. We learned last week That because we can relate to fear and we can relate to what it feels like to be afraid, we all can understand and identify with this, this truth that when we are afraid, it's hard to trust God. When we find ourselves feeling afraid, it's in those moments that we doubt and in those moments that we question and it's in those moments that we really have to come to terms with what we believe and what we don't believe about God. Because... We find ourselves having a difficulty trusting God when we're afraid. We know that fear is literally the enemy of God's peace. Fear is the enemy of God's peace because God desires, as we learned last week, for us to learn how to live in a constant understanding that his peace is ours. That his plan for your life is to live in a state of experiencing his peace. Therefore, when fear comes against you, you do not sit back and just go, oh, here it comes again. Oh, yeah, I'm just, gonna, oh, I'm just I don't feel right. Oh, I'm scared. No, you have to understand that fear is the enemy of God's peace for your life. And it's in those moments that you have to rise up and it's in those moments that you have to make a decision of what are you going to do. Fear wants you to lay down and do nothing at all. Fear wants you to quit. Fear wants you to blame everybody else in your life. Fear wants you to do all manner of things other than what God wants for you to do. God wants you to reject the fear and bring you back to a place of peace. And it all starts right here with finding the peace of God in his word. God's word freely dispenses the truth that eradicates the fear. It freely dispenses the very thing that will soothe your heart, or your soul. Jesus offered to us last week this understanding that he wants for us to live in a place of peace. Tonight we're going to pick up in John chapter 15 and we're going to continue reading the words of Jesus where we left off last week. John chapter 15 and verse number one says these words, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't bear or doesn't produce fruit. And he, the Father, prunes the branches 
that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. Jesus said, you have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. Now remain in me and I will remain in you. A branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father. Jesus says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you're my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. A few weeks ago, we were talking about this love that Jesus talked about. When I see this very, very profound setting and I see Jesus teaching and disposing truth to these guys, I see a progression that begins to happen. The first thing that I see is that Jesus really wants for them to understand the agape love of God. The God love that is totally different than the love that we exchange between each other. A love that is completely founded on a different set of criteria. We've learned over the last few weeks that that God's agape love is not a love by chance. It's not something that you just feel for somebody. It's a love by choice. It's a love that is an act of the will that God literally takes and feels inside of his people for us to begin to do the same for each other. Jesus gets down on his knees in this setting and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. And he begins to demonstrate to them through an act of humility, not just an ordinary act, but a very extraordinary act of humility. Never in these guys' mind would they think that their leader, the top dog, the guy that calls the shots, would get down at that level of a lowly house servant, somebody that they probably didn't even know his name, and they kick off their flip-flops, and their feet are filled with dirt and grime from the dusty streets, and they let the lowly house servant clean their toes. And Jesus says, I want to do that for you. And they're like, no way, you cannot clean my toes. My toes are nasty. That is not going to happen, Jesus. And of course, as we read the story and talked about it, we realized that Jesus says, "I'm I'm not doing what you think I'm doing here. This has nothing to do with your gross, disgusting toes, which they are, by the way, I'm sure. He says, this is all about love. This is all about the kingdom economics This is all about you learning that if you're going to experience what I'm about to teach you, you got to get things in a completely different order. And it starts by learning how to humble yourself. It starts by learning how to get low. Now, some of us think that humility 
is all about us being a nobody. And that's not what humility is about. Notice that Jesus told them, I must serve you if you're going to experience this God love that I want to teach you about. They were eager to serve him. They said, no, Jesus, let us do the low work. In other words, they were very, they were very cued in to the fact that, well, if I need to do whatever you ask me to do, then I'm willing to do that. You want me to serve? I'll get down there and serve whatever you want me to do, Jesus. If this is the way this game works, I'm great at playing games. I'll just, I'll be the servant guy. That's what you want me to do. But Jesus is like, no, no, no. You're going to let me serve you. See, the act of humility had to do with vulnerability. The act of humility had to do with them experiencing Jesus encroaching on their space in such a way that made them sweat and very uncomfortable. The act of humility was like, I am going to break down every defense mechanism that you have and I'm going to come close. No, 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 no. You can't come that close, Jesus. Let me just stay busy. I'll scrub the toilets. I'll do this. I'll do that. I will just work, 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 and I'll show you. I'm humble. I'm a servant. And Jesus is like, no, you don't understand. Unless I wash you, you have no part of me. See, pride can look really, really good at times. Pride can look like you're the lowest person in the room. And inside, in your heart, you're still way up here giving yourself major kudos because I'm the lowest person in the room. God's so proud of me. I'm so glad that everybody knows what's really going on. I'll never say this out loud. But on the inside, I haven't gotten any of the lesson that Jesus wants me to get yet. My friends, this is where he starts. He said, this is where lessons begin. This is where it starts. And he begins to dispense about the agape love of God. And then last week he says, and then I want you to learn about my peace. I'm going to give you my peace. And I want you to learn that in a world full of chaos and in a world full of storms and in a world full of troubles coming your way, you're going to be able to experience peace. And then tonight, he goes even deeper and he begins talking to us about this dynamic of what pruning is really all about in the kingdom. Jesus makes this bold statement. He's talking to them about his relationship with God in such a way that people were very uncomfortable that this, this rabbi, this teacher, this Jewish teacher could talk about God in such an intimate, personal way. It was mind-blowing and it was revolutionary and it ruffled a lot of feathers. But Jesus uses this analogy. He says about himself, he says, I'm like a grapevine. You guys understand that? We see them everywhere. You drive down any of our main roads out in the country and you see the row after row of these trunks, especially after the harvest is complete and everything has been cut back. You see these trunks and he's like, that is me. I am like this grapevine. I've got, I've got the root and I've got all of these things. He says, and my father, he's talking about God, is the master gardener. He's like, come on, guys, you got to stay with me. I am like this grapevine, and my father knows how to make the garden beautiful. Yeah. And then he says, and then you're in this story too. Jesus says, now I want you to know that you are a part of this in a very intimate way. He says, I'm the vine, he's the gardener, but you guys are the branches. You're in this picture. Now, these guys have got to be env envisioning this. They've got to be going, okay, okay, I'm with you, Jesus. Okay, yeah, okay, like, you know, grapes. All right, I'm with you. I can, I can understand this, this thing. But then Jesus starts to get really personal. He says, now, my father's the gardener, and he knows how to take care of the garden. He knows how to make a garden grow, and he knows how to grow the best produce. And he says, so you're the branches. He says, but these branches, he says, there's a process that's going to happen 
where the gardener is going to begin to cut things. And the things that he's going to cut have purpose behind every cut. The ones that he sees that don't produce anything, he's got to cut them off. Why? Because Jesus wants us to know that you and I are not individuals that can just do our own thing and nobody else is affected. Do you realize that if you're a branch that refuses to allow the process of God to work in your life, to grow you to a place to where you begin to grow, you're actually draining energy away from the main line that we all need to grow the fruit that we're interested in growing. And he says, my father's a gardener and he's gonna take those branches that don't produce anything. He's gonna cut them and he's gotta toss them aside. You're not alone. You are not an individual here. You are not somebody that's insignificant and doesn't matter. Every single one of you, every single one of us is connected to each other in a spiritual way. And Jesus says, and then the branches that do produce fruit, he's going to prune so that they can get stronger and healthier and produce even more fruit. He starts talking about these things, and, and I'm sure that these guys think they know what he's talking about, kind of like you and me. We think we know what Jesus is talking about, but the word of God is so powerful that every time we read it, it teaches us something new. We get down into the lesson a little bit, and in verse number 11, Jesus drops this on us. He says, I've told you all of these things so that your joy will be complete. So that you will be filled with my joy and your joy will overflow. He says, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Everybody in this room and everybody that I've ever met has something in common. You know what it is? Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. Happy. Don't worry. Be happy. No reggae fans. Anyway. Um, I just came. Anyway. Everybody wants to be happy. Happiness is one of those things that people say as a means to try to explain their existence and boil everything that's going on into their life that's good, that's bad, that's uncontrollable, that's chaos, they boil it all down to this one statement. I just want to be happy. Anybody here ever said that? Come on now. I just want to be happy. Is that too much to ask? I just want to be happy. You know, the Bible talks a lot about happiness. When I was growing up, I used to hear preachers say things like, the Bible talks about joy, and you need to talk about the joy of God, and it's not the same as happiness. And I was like, okay, I'm tracking with you. Like, I can get the difference between joy and happiness. But then I actually started studying the Word of God, and I realized that the joy and happiness are two different words that kind of mean the same thing. All over the Bible, joy and happiness are everywhere. You know what else I found when I started looking for joy and happiness in the Bible? I found that joy and happiness actually was created, and it was actually given as a gift to humanity. In other words, we have a creator that wants you to be happy. Well, that sounds great, right? Oh, cool, I went to church and the preacher said everybody should just be happy. It was such a great uplifting message. We just went home right after that because that's all that life is all about. Just be happy. <laughs> Wrong. Because biblical happiness, biblical joy, it actually comes from somewhere very, very specific. And Jesus is talking to his followers in this setting 
about where it comes from. You say, well, what was Jesus trying to say? Jesus is using an analogy of a grapevine that is actually being cut. Well, that's painful. It doesn't feel good. Anybody here like to get cut? We t- hear pruning, it's like, oh, I don't want to be pruned. Pruning means that I lose things. Pruning means that I'm, no, I don't want to be pruned. I want everything to be okay. Can we just find that scripture in, in Jason chapter 5, verse 1? I just want everything to be okay. Can you leave me alone, please? I want it to be okay. It's not there. That's not a verse in the Bible. Pruning requires a process of cutting back. Having things cut in our life is not the most happy thing. And Jesus in the middle of this analogy says, I have told you all of this so that you will be filled with my joy. I have told you of this process of I'm the vine, you're the branches. We have a father who's the gardener so that you will learn and you will live in absolute, complete happiness or joy in your life. Jesus uses another word in this teaching over and over and over and over again. This other word that he uses, some translations use the word abide. The NLT that I'm reading out of tonight uses the word remain. He says, remain in me. Over and over and over again, he says, remain in me. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Abide in me or remain in me. And in this picture of connection, Jesus begins to explain over and over and over again the source of true happiness or true joy. It comes from remaining in Christ. What's another way to say remain in me? Stay put. Don't quit. Don't disconnect. When things get difficult, when people make you angry, when the music's too loud or too quiet, when I make you upset, don't walk away and say, you know what, I am done with God and church and Christianity and all of that. Why? Because I don't feel it anymore. Everybody wants to be happy. But what everybody wants is a feeling of happiness. What God wants is not a feeling of happiness. If I were to put two choices up here and I were to say, which one do you want? Do you want to feel good? Or do you want to be good? Which would you choose? See, the biblical happiness that is offered to every single one of us that Jesus is talking about, when we connect to the vine, it takes us into a place where it literally begins to transform us into a different person. It's no longer, I feel good. It is now, I am good. I have been transformed by the righteousness of God. And as a result, I am beginning to experience new decisions and new emotions and new everything because I have found the root and the source of true happiness. You can do your own search. I don't have the time to take you through the hundreds and hundreds of verses that talk about happiness and joy in Scripture. But there's many, many. One, Psalms 119. The author says this. He says, God, make me walk along the path of your commands, for that is where my happiness is found. In Romans chapter 4, we read about how God had a relationship with Abraham and how Abraham had faith in God in such a way that God literally said, because of your faith, it has been counted to you as righteousness. We find that in this, in this part of, the, of the, the letter of Romans, Paul quotes David as he says these words in verse 7. He says, Oh, what joy 
for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of his sins. We begin to see in the scripture how God begins to relate righteousness, which leads to holiness and happiness all together. Many of us, if we think of the word holy and we think, oh, holiness, that sounds really miserable. Holy, oh, holy, 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 holy. Oh, boring, 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 boring. My friends, God is the author of joy and happiness. I don't want to rub it in your face, but I just came back from Hawaii. Oh my gosh. Everywhere I looked, I just went, God, I can't believe you thought all of this stuff up. This is incredible. The colors, the beauty, the, just all of it. Our Father, Jesus said, the master gardener looks at us as a part of his beautiful design. And he says, let me get in your life and let me begin to show you what is really going on. Some of the strongest words in scripture talk about the holiness of God, the sacredness of God, the set-apartness of God. He is all himself. We'll never come close to the holiness of God. But there is a different righteousness that's imputed or, or given to us that we're clothed in that gives us the ability to live the way that God wants for us to live. And when we begin to experience it, we begin to think of these words like holiness differently. And we do not run from them thinking holiness means boring. We begin to realize that holiness and happiness, they are synonymous. The holier that I become, the happier I become. Why? Because I begin to tune in to the things that are of God. I begin to tune into the things that bring about the absolute satisfaction for the soul of a man and of a woman. I begin to tune into the very nature of who God is. And in this analogy that we go back to again and again of this vine and the branches, Jesus says, there is a part for you to play. Stay put. Stick it out. Remain, remain, remain. Many places in the scripture talk about endurance, talk about faithfulness, talking about things like one place where it says, when you've done everything that you have possibly done, it's a part in scripture that's talking about spiritual warfare. It's talking about things coming at you that you have no control over and you're just taking it, just psh, psh, psh. And it says this, he says, when you've done everything you can do, just stand, just stand. Why? Because Jesus says your joy will come in those moments. You don't feel happy? You have one choice that will work. Ask yourself, where did I disconnect from the vine? Have your happy feelings left and all you want is the happy feelings to come back? My friends, Jesus is calling us to something deeper. He's calling us to connect in such a way that we can never disconnect because our true happiness is related to our connection, to our connectedness to Jesus. Our true happiness comes from remaining in him. The ways that we connect are so broad. It's one of the things that I love about God. I love that in the room like this with diversity everywhere, God knows how to get to every single one of your hearts and he knows how to bring you close to himself. And he knows how to make you come alive. 
all of the ways that God created this world and all of the diversity that we see all relates to the ways that you and I can learn how to connect and remain in him. Some of us love to sing. Some of us love to pray quietly. Some of us love to pray loudly. Some of us love to read. Some of us love to listen when other people read. Some of us love to go to big, exciting church services, and some of us love to just sit with a friend over coffee and just talk quietly. Some of us need lots of different things, but the point is that having a relationship with Jesus is the source of true joy. Having a relationship with Jesus is where everything begins for us to begin to understand. Having that relationship with Jesus is where we begin to move past the surface and we begin to understand what it is to remain. Having a relationship with Jesus is not something that is a one-time experience. I'm not here tonight to invite you into something that you can scratch off your list and say, oh, I've got a relationship with Jesus now. Scratch. I'm inviting you to come into an understanding by faith that Jesus came and offered redemption for mankind. And when you begin to tune in to the reality of the bigness of what God pulled off and what God did, and you begin to unite your heart with that reality and with that truth, you begin to see the world different than what you see on TV and on the internet. You begin to see a different picture that is not just about you. And it all starts with having a relationship with Christ. I invite you tonight to take that step of faith. To take that step of faith and say, Jesus, I want to have this relationship for myself. See, when I was talking a few minutes ago about how we're not individuals that have no bearing on each other, it's a true statement. Your life matters and what you do affects me, whether you believe it or not. But having a relationship with Christ, knowing That when everybody abandons you, you are still not alone. Means that you have to come to a place to where you begin to tune into this understanding that if God is for me, who else can possibly be against me? It does not matter what it looks like on the outside. It does not matter what, my, what it looks like on my bank account. It does not matter what the doctor just handed me in the report on my health. It doesn't matter because when I begin to understand that me remaining in Christ, that me sticking it out, that me staying put, that me finding my source of true joy comes not from a feeling that is dictated upon the events of my life, but it is rooted in an understanding of who I have become in Christ. Joy begins to become a different thing than it's ever been before. And I invite you, I I cast seed out right now like a farmer going through old school bag of seed. I'm casting seed out and I'm praying that some of it hits your heart right now. I'm praying that some of your hearts right now are in a place where you're just like, I'm getting what you're throwing down. I want you to close your eyes with me right now. We close our eyes tonight, not because there's something magical when we close our eyes, but it's because there's something that lines up with the teachings of God's word that says that God wants for us to examine our hearts. So when we close our eyes, it gives us the ability to look inward, and I want every person to do that right now. Close your eyes. And with those closed eyes, take a look at your heart instead. And I want you to examine the condition of the motives of your heart in this moment. What drives you? What makes you do the things that you do? What is the primary focus of your life? And if you don't know how to answer that question, I want you to ask this, what do I think about the most? Because what you think about the most, most likely, is a major motivator in your life. Maybe you're worried about something and you can't stop fretting over it. You can't stop 
stressing over it. Whatever it is, in that place is where God wants to touch you right now. In that place is where God wants to meet you in this moment. In that place is where God wants to connect with you. The Bible says that because of Jesus, we could put our trust in him and find salvation. Every sin that we've ever committed can be washed because of the precious blood of the perfect lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We could put our faith and our trust in Jesus and we can say, Jesus, I want to have that relationship with you. I choose to agree with heaven. I choose to agree with the, the perfect plan of God to come and save us. Say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I come to you honestly tonight. I'm not playing games. I'm not hiding anything. I want to know you. I want to experience your life. I want to learn how to connect into you. Take everything that I've heard tonight and apply it to my heart as only you can. I want to know you. Make me a lover of your truth. Make me a lover of your word. Make me a lover of your ways. God, I pray for every heart in this room right now, and I thank you that as you draw us to yourself, you redeem us and you heal us and you give us your life. So Jesus, come and move in this place. Holy Spirit, move in this place. You have what we need. Come to these tables tonight. Come to these tables and take the bread and take the juice It represents the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. Examine your heart and give thanks for what Jesus has done. And worship. And worship and experience the joy, the happiness that God has for your life tonight.